Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. Well, for this episode of the Krabby Pastor podcast, I am excited to have a guest, Reverend Dr. Deborah Runlett is with me, and she was one of my instructors in my doctoral program at Ashland Theological Seminary, and I'm excited to have her here with me. I'm going to let you, Deborah, first, and I, I probably should have warned you ahead of time, but I'm going to let you first introduce yourself and tell us what you're up to these days, because it's you're always doing interesting stuff, and it shifts and changes. And then I'm I'm going to ask you what makes you crabby, because I got called on this. Uh, I did this podcast, and the it, the person I was interviewing, we got all the way to the end, and he said, "Well, aren't you going to ask me what makes me crabby? This is <laughs> called the Crabby Pastor Podcast." So, so now I kind of integrate that. And sorry for the ambush, but I'm sure you'll come up with something. So, Deborah, if you wouldn't mind, just introduce yourself. So I'm Deborah Rundlett, and I'm an ordained Presbyterian pastor, a recovering judicatory leader, who um, a couple of years ago, actually five years ago, thought I need to be back on the ground. And at that point, I founded Poets and Prophets. Uh, it's a spiritual community to reach those who do not identify with institutional religions. And that began a journey. It began a journey of exploring where wisdom is wanting to come above ground uh, in response to all the changes that are happening across our planet and uh, to look at the implica implications of the formation, the spiritual formation of the leader. In the midst of that, I got called home because my mom was entering the latter stages of dementia. And it was clear that I needed to be on the ground, but I also needed some boundaries. So when you ask what makes me crabby, <laughs> it I mean other people think that they can orchestrate my schedule. <laughs> and especially when those other people are my siblings, as beloved as they are. So my husband challenged me and he said, well, why don't you take a part-time call? Poets and Prophets will still be there. And indeed it is. And it's a piece of the work that I do every week. But I ended up taking a part-time call, a tent-making call, with an itty-bitty dying congregational church in Connecticut. And this church is located in a meeting house. And for those who think that the meeting house is a Quaker thing, actually, mm -hmm. there are 640 congregational meeting houses across New England. And mm -hmm. this is one of them. And the meeting house was at the center of the town square. It was the place where the community gathered for every aspect of their life, including worship. And as we began to distill and explore what it meant to be a spiritual community in the 21st century, we began to realize how important that connection to community was. So for the last five years, we have been one of 15 congregations in the United Church of Christ exploring new forms of community. And that's what we do. Okay. And it's been amazing. I mean, this is interesting because you're talking about these meeting houses as being community space, including worship. So yes. they probably conducted governmental meetings or informational kinds of meetings. And the community was brought into that space for that purpose, which is kind of interesting because today's typical model church is, you know, you have the church and, and I don't know, you might have the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts come in occasionally, but it's not necessarily seen as um, the center and the hub. And, and of course, things have changed. It's the 21st century now. So, well, and you know that this thing called COVID happened. Right. 
So everything got shut down. But in the midst of it, this meeting house has been here since 1760. That's an important marker, which I'll reference later. But we were asked to ring the bell every single night for our essential workers and medical personnel. And that engaged the entire neighborhood. Ring the bell. Ring the bell for what? The tower bell. Once a day to acknowledge them? or to acknowledge them. Oh, And the whole neighborhood showed up to ring the bell. So there was a waiting list to ring the bell. People got on the lawn, socially distanced as their family units, and rang their own bells. with the, And it became one of the ways in which the community actually began to come out of their houses and gather. That then led us into conversations with the community in lawn chairs, in the parking lot, again, socially gathered as to why is this 5.65 acre campus here? It used to be the center of this community. What's needed in this community now? And passion precedes purpose, uh, deep, deep concern about the environment. So the wetlands are being restored on the property now, driven by the neighborhood, not by those who happen to be members of Ridgebury Congregational Church housed within the meeting house. So we now look at the meeting house as one house, many rooms inside and out. Um, The four program, if you will, but they're not really programs, the four areas of passion, the arts. So we have opened a community art gallery for artists of all ages, basically age two on up. And Hmm. the exhibits uh, rotate every month. We, But we also have conversations about how art matters and shapes the, the whole person. And that brought a collaborative rental partner called Art in Common, working with the arts through issues with refugees, through identity issues, through diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Again, expanding beyond what we ourselves could do as a local congregation and reconnecting us as a center in the community. Meanwhile, uh, Cornerstone Home and Gardens has become another partner who now works with neurologically divergent adults to farm the land. They claim that their sweet corn is the best sweet corn produced here Mm -hmm. in part of Connecticut, along with their heirloom tomatoes. And so we'll find out this summer. Um, Wow. We're anticipating that they'll be pretty awesome. But what, what you're saying, I mean, I want you to give us the stats, you know, the noses, because I've said before, it's someone else, an author said this, this isn't my thinking, nickels and noses is what has mattered for a long time in the church. So how many people were in attendance at this church? I'll start there. Where, go ahead. We have a congregation of 21. Okay. So and- this is this is 21, and you, you identified them as a, a dying congregation, correct? Correct. And that congregation now worships between 25 and 35 on Sunday mornings. They're a predominantly older congregation. There's tenderness as 35 people show up to help clear invasives and create paths down to the pond. And this is not a bait and switch. This isn't, hey, we'll have fun creating paths and then show up on worship. We've made a commitment to move beyond what we call the ABCs of attendance, buildings, cash on hand, to the DEFs, discipleship, equipping and formation, and to find ways to do that that fit the needs of the 21st century. And we're learning. We have no idea what we're doing, but we figure out what works. We let go of what doesn't work. And that's where Poets and Prophets comes in, where we've extended invitations to leaders around the community and literally around the globe to look at what does it mean to nurture the poet and prophet within? And how does that then relate to our formational journey? to our core identity, you know what I'm about to say, to character being transformed degree by degree until it takes on the likeness of Christ, to understanding that call is found in the intersection of our strengths and passions. Passion precedes purpose, but not just because we want to do it in response to the needs of the community. And then we might begin to look at competencies. But but first, core identity, character, call in the context of the whole community. And, and so when you say community, you're not just talking about the faith community. Oh, you're no. talking not about predominantly. Yeah, you're talking uh, about the place where this meeting house is planted, the town. Yes, exactly. Right. So yeah. so even as I hear you talk about the kinds of things, the kind of endeavors that this group is collaborating 
with other businesses and groups in the community to bring about, to be a blessing to the community, who decided what these items would be? How were they evolved? So this is a congregational church, which means everything is decided by everyone. However, it is also the congregation made the commitment to restore the commons. So if you were to read um, Diana Butler Bass's book, Grounded, there is a whole chapter on the New England commons and the importance of it and the source of it being the congregational church. So for them, they're going back to their DNA. They're remembering that they were always the ones to provide the commons for the community in those early years before our nation was even founded. Mm. And with that comes a commitment and a responsibility as one house, many rooms, to understand that some will find themselves in their way into the worshiping community, but others are going to find their way into other rooms. However, if the whole leader requires the whole person, then that's an engagement of body, mind, and soul. It's not just simply our competencies or our intellectual um, prowess. It is the formation of the whole leader in this liminal time and space where the reality is we're in a hinge time in history and we get to lay the foundation for right. the next cycle. Yes. And, you know, I I don't think it's a surprise that this is where we find the church in a transitional kind of time. And people are looking at who are we for this era. And all of us had our roots shaken pretty well with COVID. Mm -hmm. And this has left many leaders wondering, you know, what to do next. And some leaders are just busy reassembling what was before COVID. And the challenge for us in this day, space, and time is to, I would always say, not be running on the hamster wheel so that you can hear the call of the Holy Spirit into some new things and into new endeavors where the church exists to bless their community. And I'm thinking of a community here. I'm in Oxford, Michigan, where there was an active shooter situation in the high school about a year and a half ago. And we're still traumatized and working through all of that. And a Lutheran church with a pretty uh, broad-minded meaning, he doesn't think of just his group of followers, broad-minded thinking of the town and the area that has endured this trauma, his group, that church is doing fundraisers. So you might go to the local brewery and and pay to be part of a Euchre tournament. And all the funds have gone into a place where people can come and bring their proof of payment for mental health services and get reimbursed. And this small group, I'm not sure they're 100. I don't think they are. They have managed to give away $100,000 plus. Mm. And, and just purely to bless the community to make a difference in their community. And I, I so resonate with that picture. That fund is totally separate from their operating costs and their tithing and any other missional kinds of endeavors. It's totally just, we're going to do these fundraisers. Come on out and uh, raise raise some funds for people's mental health costs because, you know, they're not cheap. So, <laughs> but they're dearly needed. So that is, uh, you know, a, I think it's a step in a good direction for them so that they're blessing their community. Talk to me some about the historic significance of the meeting house. I think you went all the way back. You started in the 1700s and then talked about different, you know, there was influenza in there, which I thought was kind of interesting because here we are on, on our little trajectory and, and then COVID and, you know, now we're all kind of, Whoa, what do we do now? Well, what we found is that in 1820, 1920, and then again in 2020, there needed to be a very intentional choice to choose life. But as we looked deeper, it wasn't just simply this, we choose life and everything's going to be fine. Um, 
that choice is made in the midst of the cultural context and the environmental context and the historical context in which we find ourselves. So during the influenza, 1918, 1990, 19, the congregation literally closed and then was reopened in 1920. Here, we, you know, we had distilled that there was revival and renewal in the 20s for each of those centuries, but we hadn't made the connection we'll let them go by, that actually it was in the midst of crisis. But there's something wonderful about crisis because crisis opens you up to your community. Everybody's looking to work together to make a difference. And everybody's a choice point. And everybody wants to come ring the bell, right? For something. In our case, that was, you know, one of those quirky things that you could not have planned that becomes one of the Kairos moments. Right. It opens the door to relationships in a in a time and a place where people, you know, uh, press the button, the garage door opens and they go. The garage door comes down. Well, everybody was home and needed a way to come out safely. And that mm. belt provided it. And then when you were saying they needed to choose life, this you're talking about bringing a congregation and, and they're at a place where, OK, we're either going to dig in and move forward or we're just going to close the doors and not exist anymore. That's the choose life piece that you were. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so remember, I was a judicatory leader and I taught a doctoral track in leadership. I began to wonder if I was asking pastors and their teams to accomplish things that weren't possible. So part of the return to the ground was this sense that absolutely it's possible, but letting go precedes taking hold. And so the things that we define as most central, even worship on Sunday mornings, perhaps we're misunderstanding. Perhaps worship is supposed to be the whole of our lives. How then do we worship God in the whole of our lives? How do we take that focus off the Sunday morning preacher and the Sunday morning experience to begin to weave that fabric in which we glorify God in everything we say and do. Mm. And I, 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 you made me think about how we hold things and mm. that we need to hold them with an open hand in such a way that should God decide, I need you to let go of that, I'm going to take it, that we're okay with that no matter what that is, as opposed to clenching on and saying, no, 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 you're not taking that. We're, we're going to keep doing this forever and ever and eternity into eternity. And so we're best to travel with our hands open to allow God to re- maybe remove some things. So we're not. Well, and know. Foster would say palms down. So how do we begin palms down to release whatever God's not asking us to carry? Mm. or that we're confusing with God. And how do we, and then palms up to receive what God would give us. Augustine said long ago, our hands are too full to receive the good that God desires to give us. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, so we, we did palms down. We just put everything on the altar. We put worship, we put Sunday school, we put all that traditional expectation born of the last century. Mm -hmm. Coming to understand that, yes, there's an element of discipleship in Christian education, but the truth is Jesus taught the adults and blessed the children. Many of our churches today think of Sunday school as the place where the children go. And if we're entering into the perichoresis of the Trinity and into that dance and relationship, how are we actually inviting people into Mm -hmm. that relationship? And what does it mean? So so you're, you're not exactly existing to get more butts in the pews. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. You're existing and you've, you've uh, trained your people to serve. And then, and I frequently said this to pastors as I was involved in revitalization process, they would say, well, I pastors would say, well, we can't do this. We don't have enough people. And I said, well, where could you go get some more people? Exactly. No, I mean, there, I said, the boy scouts need to get hours, volunteer hours, honor, Society students need more. There might be some professional people in your in your midst that could come along and enhance what you're doing. And I know in uh, the last place I served, it was a merger of four and a half churches, and then we constructed 
we renovated a building is what we did. And they wanted to know where the kitchen was. And I'm telling you, that just put a knot in my stomach because I could see all those little labels on the on all of the cabinets and on all the drawers. And it's it like was this turf war that just as a as a pastor made me a nervous wreck. And and I said, no, no, we're not having we are not having a kitchen. And they said, well, how are we going to have our spaghetti dinners? And I said, well, what were you having spaghetti dinners for? And they said, we got to raise money for our for our operating costs. And I said, oh, my gosh. I said, well, now you just told me that you have stewardship issues here. <laughs> so mm. I did not allow a, a kitchen. We had a warming kitchen and mm -hmm. a coffee bar. And I said, if we want to have a meal, we're going to engage a business owner who's trying to get a catering business going, they're mm -hmm. going to come in and we're going to be friends with them and their workers. And we're going to bless them with, you know, regular business. And that's, a, that was a, my a fellowship with one another. Yes. And that's my, you know, let's think about this differently so that our people are not back in the kitchen hiding from the guests, you know? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, we will have a kitchen. We're going through a massive renovation to repurpose the entire campus. But that kitchen will be a ghost kitchen to allow entrepreneurs who want to start a catering business or cooking classes, or in one case, a cooking podcast, or I guess it would be Something. web, uh, YouTube, yeah, yeah, yeah. to be able to do so. Yeah, that's and that's an innovative look at how you can be friends with people and and still serve and bless the community. And I said, I said, we need to raise worms. Mm -hmm. and, and that came from a congregant who had the most bodacious flowers. And I said, what are you doing to these flowers? Is it miracle Grow? Is it what? And she said, it's worm poo. And she showed me her little drawer wow. of worms and how they ate the food and the Worm and who dropped went down. drop down and then she put it in the plants. And I said, you oh, can make this fertilizing. Yeah, I know we could make a business. But the point of having the business would be to help train people how to have a business because you could have the website, you could have customer service, you could have the people back tending the worms and the worm poo and the, you know, and then you get community involvement, say, bring your corn cobs down here because the worms love them. You know, I mean, there's, there's ways that you could still connect with people and seek to bless your community. Yes, it's true. And we got to care about the relationship. Again, not a bait and switch, not a butt in the pew. Right, right. And I, I've said that to people before that we've been guilty of, oh, come here to our event, wink, wink. And so that wink, wink, you can then wink, wink, come and be part of us and do the things that we do in the way that we do them and the way that we want them done. Yeah. And, and we snuff out the creative energies of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like you're on an assembly line and I can talk about that because I'm in the Rust Belt. Um, and frequently here in, in Michigan, when you tell people we've got to do better, they think you have to stand on the line and go faster, you know, get more things through, kind of like Lucy and Ethel on the candy line. That'll, mm -hmm. that'll date me that, that picture. Yeah, that, <laughs> that'll date me. But you know, where the, uh, the assembly line is moving faster and faster and you're getting more done, but, but you're really not. And where that leaves you is in a place of spiritual independence from the workings of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and exhausted. Yeah, that. Absolutely exhausted. You know, as you were talking about it, it made me think of wisdom from Henry Nowen, where he said, hospitality is not to make the stranger one of us, but to create the space in which the stranger can come and, and be, and in that being become fully themselves, whatever that means. And that's what we're doing here. We've also found, remember, I told you our membership's 21. Mm -hmm. And we're worshiping on any given Sunday between 25 and 35 people are there in worship, which is a significant increase when you think about the size of the congregation. Percentage, yeah. Percentage wise. <laughs> and, but it is, it's not a, that's not the goal. Our goal is to actually serve the needs of the community. And then we find that there are those who are drawn, not necessarily the ones who have been served. 
but wanting to come and be a part of it. Yep. Yep. I know one church that I served, we did get a food ministry going. And, you know, one of my congregants said, Pastor, why aren't these people getting in here and helping us? I'm like, well, you you can't, if you're serving to get something back, that's not serving. Not serving. You just, yeah. you just got to serve. And then just like what you said, it was like, God looked down and went, Oh, look, it's percolating down there. You know, let me send some other people and people who had not uh, been part of that serving and food process just kind of started showing up. It was, it was really um, mind boggling for me anyway, at the time. And I thought, Oh, Hey, maybe we've hit on something. I mean, I having taught revitalization process, process quite a few times um you know people just you know raise their hand and they just say what's the magic bullet here how do we get people in here well you know i did i did start telling people here's the magic bullet everybody's got to go out and be friends with somebody and not not just like friends for the sake of getting them in here but like friends friends you might have to invest a couple years in that friendship and build a relationship and see if they're at some point interested. And that, I think that is the piece that the church needs to hear today is that oh, it is yeah. about relationship. It is not about uh, programs, really. People want to be engaged with other people and programs can then work into that, but it's gotta be predominantly relationship, I think anyway. You probably have more Wait, good stuff oh, to I add. I totally <laughs> agree with that. I mean, it, it brings me back. Did we ever... George Bullard uses the um, the image of a car and visions in the driver's seat and, yep. and next to vision is relationship. And in the back seat, I mean, they're still there is program and process and, and the structures that support yep. it. All. But only in response to the vision in the relationship. Yep. The and it's vision in the, the back relationship. seat. So I have also taught about in revitalization process that every church can have a sweet spot of ministry, and it is a function of doing your homework about your community Mm -hmm. and finding out what the community needs, seeing what the passion of the leadership is, and then what the giftedness of your people are. So, and the sweet spot right there is, is where you want to create a ministry and you don't have to create five ministries. I think if you just did one that was over the top, amazing to serve your community, that that's, yeah. that's sufficient. You know, I, we, we think we've got to have all 50 spokes of the wheel. And really, if you just had one really good um, process or way that you serve your community, I, th- I think you've nailed it. Absolutely. And uh- the reality is, if in fact we have are in a congregation that's been on extended decline, uh, the energy level is not going to be there for more than that one thing. Mm-hmm. And it's being realistic. Apps. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I frequently thought about um, people who now are maybe in their eighties, eighty-five, in your congregations, and you think. Wow. You know, I mean, they've been there probably faithful and to the best of their ability, serving God in the ways that they know and understand as a function of what their probably pastor slash leader taught them to do and to be. And and then at the end of everything, you know, years of faithfulness, do you just kick people to the curb then? And, and I don't think that's an accurate picture either. I think there's something that we all can do. And and then we have to go find other people to come do it with us. If we have a, a, a good enough thing, like the commons or having that area and that space that this church way back in the 1700s provided, they found that in their in their DNA. That's pretty pretty amazing or like the church in in my neighborhood over here that saw the need for mental health services and decided just we're going to raise money and have a fund and we're going to give people okay. money for that and i've often wondered about i i just grip my teeth every time i go by i wanted to say loan shark on the on the <laughs> on the marquee outside of these businesses that are 
you bring your paycheck in there and and paycheck oh, loan oh, those places oh. i think we should all be uh, demonstrating in front of those places because i had a cousin get into them and she could, she had trouble getting out because they set it up in such a way yeah i mean it's, it's a terrifying. it's a it's a business it's model it's terrifying. a business model how could the church then raise some money and, and help some people with short term loans and you know things like that which you'd have to get some good financial people in and there are models so you know so part of it is uh, again, passion precedes purpose. So in some congregations, there would be individuals who are working with community banks who would know exactly how to set that up and make it possible mm -hmm. and let them build back their credit accordingly yeah. with payments that they can afford to pay back each month yeah. without yeah. foregoing food or failing to pay rent or, you know, any number of those things. Mm. Yeah, it is all about, though. I mean, for me, that brings us back to passion and relationship. Mm hmm. It, it does. When I was leading the merger, it was four and a half congregations and we were worshiping in a school and we were getting pretty frustrated. We had ex expended the, the real estate market to try to find a place because all the buildings were sold. We pooled the money. We went shopping, but you know, it takes a long time to find something. And we had a pretty short list of what we were looking for and we just couldn't find it. And one day I said, well, what if we just don't? get a building what if we just take this money and we buy a couple of houses and we house women who are coming out of trafficking or we whatever i said why don't we do something like that i mean i'd have been the pastor that would have been game for let's try this and see what happens um but it was it was a tough sell so they wanted their building and and many do and, and that's not to say that you can't be effective in a building you certainly can well, you have to use fact, it as a tool. Have you, um, I don't know if you've tracked with what a team of millennial researchers are doing out of Harvard Divinity School, but the Sacred Design Lab actually is pulling people out of their buildings. And for us, it was really helpful to be in conversation with them because we realized how important place was. Mm. There has to be a location for community. And if indeed part of the historic hospitality is to provide those commons, then we're going to do that. Right. Right. Well, the goal of this conversation, in my mind anyway, was to just kind of stir things up for anybody that is listening and, you know, that the spirit would be at work, that uh, people would be dreaming some dreams about what uh, what God would have you to do and to be so that you can be in community as well as bless your community, because it's going to mean something different for everybody else. In my doctoral thesis, I coined the term franchise dance. And I said, we have got to stop doing the franchise dance and just replicating what everybody else is doing or what the, the, the biggest fad is at the moment, what's trending now that we all have to do. And then it kind of reverberates through everywhere but really sincerely stopping and asking God, what should we be about? How can we bless our community? How can we bless our community? Do you have any parting thoughts, Deborah, that you would like to offer us? Yes. Don't forget to play. Oh. You know, joy is contagious. And when we take the time to play, it gets us into different parts of our brains and our bodies. And it releases some of the ought self thinking like, we ought to be doing X, oh, Y, yeah. and Z. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, my, we, my, my spiritual director called that should. And she would say to me, stop shooting on yourself all the time, you know, and that, yeah, the play and, and not being afraid. This goes with play, I think. Not being afraid to try something. Exactly. And just see what happens. And if you never fail at anything, it's because you're not trying anything. <laughs> so you need to be trying. And even if you fail, try something else. Then eventually you will get to where you need to be uh, because you're you're still in process and you're still on the journey and you're still testing the water, so to speak. Yeah. All well, of the, uh, 
Well, thank you very much for joining us here on the Krabby Pastor Podcast. And I wish you blessings. And I will put information about the Meeting House in the show notes. So if you want to go check that out, uh, and I will get other information for that, that Deborah will probably provide me with. So you can maybe just sort of scope some things out, but be in prayer about what, uh, what God would have for you to be about. Hey, thanks for listening. It is my deep desire and passion to champion issues of sustainability in ministry and for your life. So I'm here to help. I stepped back from pastoral ministry and I feel called to help ministry leaders uh, create and cultivate sustainability in their lives so that they can go the distance with God and whatever plans that God has for you. I would love to help. I would consider it an honor. And in all things, Make sure you connect to these sustainability practices, you know, so that you don't become the crabby pastor.